Hey there, and welcome to A Well-Rounded Life, the podcast, a space for creative entrepreneurs seeking an intentional life and biz filled with grace, passion, and purpose. I'm your host, Jamira. I'm a mama, wife, dessert fanatic, and on the ultimate mission to get you closer to your idea of what it means to live a well-rounded life. Right here is where you'll find curated resources, quick tips, and relatable stories, no matter what season of life you're in. So hang out with me for a bit and let's dive in. What's up, Well-Rounders? Welcome back to the show. Jamira here, and I am thrilled that you are hanging out with me today. I am also hanging with my friend, Shalise Tyson. Shalise Tyson is a wealth of information. She is just great conversation, a great person, down to earth, and someone that I know you are going to resonate with. Shalise and I discuss disappointment, what it's like raising a child with type 1 diabetes, and the recent loss of her father. So today's show is definitely a conversation amongst friends and a conversation that I know will be a blessing to someone out there listening. So before we get all the way into the interview, I'm going to read Shalise's official bio so that you can get to know her a little better. Shalise Tyson is a lifestyle content creator who is passionate about cheering on women to grow, achieve goals, and glow from the inside out. Through her personal brand, blog, and motivational apparel shop, Shalise is creating a space and community for glow getters to feel seen, motivated, and celebrated as they live their lives and pursue their dreams. Shalise's passion for celebrating others also shows up through her event planning career as the owner of Sensational Soirees, an award-winning planning and design company in Maryland. In addition to pursuing her professional passions, Shalise's greatest joy is sharing her life with her husband and their two kids. Let's welcome Shalise to A Well-Rounded Life. Hey, Shalise. Welcome to Living Well-Rounded. How are you? I am fantastic. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I was just telling you I need to get my energy towards the end of the day. And I'm trying to get my energy back, but I'm excited to talk to you because you're always such a joy to chat with and always so uplifting. So this shall be a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. But before we get into the nitty gritty, do me a favor and tell the Well-Rounders a little bit about yourself. Well, um, as you mentioned, my name is Shalise. I am a lifestyle content creator. And in that space, I am a champion for glow getters. And what I define a glow getter is a woman who's committed to growth, achieving her goals and glowing from the inside out. So I am just in a space of wanting to encourage those women because I am that woman. So um, that's sort of what I do online. I have a blog. I have a shop where I sell uh, merchandise, glow getter apparel. Let's see what else about me. I also own a event planning company called Sensational Soirees based in the DMV area. I'm a mom. I'm a wife, uh, a music lover, a pizza lover. That's sort of me in a nutshell. I love it. And I love how you say you champion. Um, in the glow getter lifestyle. Yes, you guys make sure you check out Shalise's website because she has some bomb merch. I have some in my closet. So I want to make sure you head over there. But yeah, Shalise and I have a lot of things in common. We both met when I was planning weddings and she is also an amazing wedding and event planner and designer in the DMV. And we have children that are around the same age. And so I want to know, Shalise, how have you been managing their well-being, and everything that has been going on during this pandemic. Yes, uh, a lot has been going on during this time. For my kids, they've been they've been managing pretty well, I would say. Of course, they miss seeing their friends all the time and their family members. They miss going to school in person and all that stuff. But I would say overall, they've been managing pretty well. One of the things that has been important for my husband and I is to just sort of create some normalcy in this unique climate. So for us, that really looks like just, you know, being able to make our time at home as enjoyable for them as possible. So oftentimes in the evenings after school, you know, we'll play Uno, we'll watch movies. We cook a lot. The kids, they love to cook. So, you know, we'll cook. One of the things that used to be Their favorite thing to do was to go to brunch on Sundays, but, you know, we haven't been doing that. So now on Sundays, you know, we get up and we make big breakfast together, just things like that, just really sort of creating a fun environment at home, 
and just supporting them, you know, on the days where, you know, they wish we could go somewhere, you know, just just really trying to make the time at home as enjoyable as possible. I mean, personally, as a mom, I know I'll never get this time back, you know, to be able to spend this this much time with them. So, you know, some days it's a lot, you know, it's sort of mom in 24 seven, but I am um, I am appreciative of it at the same time. And what I love is scrolling IG and seeing your stories pop up because you are very hands-on with your kids. You uh, do cooking classes with them virtually and you do arts and crafts. You inspire me to actually get them from out in front of the TV and actually doing some things hands-on, which is which is so awesome. And speaking of the cooking, I know that for your son, making sure he has healthy meals is super important to you and for his health. So Let's chat a bit about your son and his diagnosis and all of the things surrounding your initial thoughts when he was diagnosed. And you can share with the audience exactly what was going on there. My son, he is a type one diabetic. He's um, nine years old right now. He was diagnosed when he was six. Essentially, with type one diabetes, your pancreas stops producing insulin. Insulin, um, for those of us who don't have type 1 diabetes, we, we our bodies naturally produce that. We need the insulin in order to t- turn our food into energy. So with Cameron having type 1 diabetes, that requires for him to get insulin every single day, honestly, just to eat. You know, when we first found out about it, like I said, he was six. I would say it was sort of devastating for me simply in that there is no cure for type 1 diabetes. So I think as a parent, you know, Of course, you don't want anything, you know, to to happen to your children. Um, You know, you don't want them to be sick. I think for me, it was it was extremely difficult, you know, again, because there is no current cure for type one diabetes. And although I would say that it hasn't limited him from being able to have um, a good quality of life to be able to enjoy life, he's still able to play football. He's still able to do many of the, the things that he enjoys doing. He can still, you know, have a cupcake here and there. So he, he can still have a good life. But again, this is something that he has to, to live with day in and, and day out. So, you know, a part of sort of his, our management of his type 1 diabetes is testing his blood sugar daily, giving him insulin for every meal. Um, as you sort of mentioned, monitoring what he eats, you know, he's not able just to to go into the pantry and grab a pack of fruit snacks like my daughter could. You know, we kind of have to talk about, you know, the fruit snacks and he could potentially need some insulin in order to even have it. So it's really just um, a daily management. And, you know, again, it was it was hard at the beginning. But I think for me, what what sort of helped me to to come around and, and to just be more optimistic about it was his positive attitude from the time that he was diagnosed. I mean, he didn't complain. Like when he first got those insulin injections, I mean, even adults don't like getting shots. I know I know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, you know, those initial, you know, first pricks, um, you know, to um to test his blood sugar and then those injections for insulin, he didn't even cry. Like he didn't even cry. So I honestly think just his ability just to adapt it has totally matured him in so many ways. And I mean, even with, you know, sort of like the food piece of it all, like he's developed a love for food and wants to become a chef. So, you know, it's just, even though it wasn't something that we wanted him to have, we're still able to find some joy in it all and, um, you know, just, just make it work. It's interesting because since, was it October, my dad went into the hospital with pancreatitis And I think that's how you pronounce it. Since then, his diabetes has gone to type one because you broke it down just now that how important the pancreas is, which I had no clue until my dad got sick. And then his diabetes changed to, I think he was two and then it went to one. And so now he has to live with that because as you mentioned, there's no cure. So he is now in a different stage, a new stage in having to make his health more so a priority. We're just so grateful that he's here, but it was, it's very scary when you are dealing with something unknown, unfamiliar, and then you're looking and seeking answers. And so uh, it makes me think um, as far as like the kids are concerned, like what kind of discussions do you have with your son and your daughter and the family so that they know that your son's health is super important, his well-being is a top priority, 
Like, how do you have those conversations so that they can feel comfortable about his new norm? Yeah, great question. So in the beginning, when it, it all first happened, it it was really just sort of changing everything because think about a six-year-old. A six-year-old is used to, like I mentioned, eating fruit snacks whenever they want, you know, chicken nuggets and, you know, French fries, juice filled with sugar, you know, having to sort of change that. And I mean, again, he can still certainly have, you know, pizza. He can have chicken nuggets still. But a lot of those conversations that we have now is about the moderation of it all. And then also coupled with that, you know, he's only nine. I'm a woman of faith. So I do believe and I pray often that there will be a cure for this disease in my lifetime. Um, So I'm holding out on faith for that. But in the meantime, you know, it could that that could happen years and years and years from now. So in order to 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 live and thrive beyond type one, you have to really take care of your body. So we have conversations about that often. So if it's if it's a day, you know, where we're ordering pizza. Maybe two slices is is what's going to be ideal for him. Maybe three at best. He is a growing boy, though. So right. he might want that fourth slice or that fifth slice. And that's where we have to say, Cameron, no, you 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 can't do that. Because whereas you might feel this, this momentary satisfaction from having this extra slice, your sugar is going to be extremely high. It's going to make your stomach really, really hurt. We don't know what the long-term effects of, you know, doing this over a period of time could be. So we sort of, you know, lay out the week in that. We don't make it too restrictive because it's been a couple years for us now. So he pretty much eats the same thing. We've got a really good routine and rhythm going on where, you know, for dinner, we'll typically have things like, you know, salmon and vegetables, things that aren't really heavy on carbs. You know, maybe for lunch, you know, he might have a little heavier um, car meal for lunch and then something light for breakfast. So we try to balance it out that way. So at least once a day, he's getting some of those things that he wants as opposed to every meal. So he knows that we sort of talk through that piece in terms of conversations with other um, family members like, like my daughter, because my daughter doesn't have type one. One of the things that was really important for us when it first happened was, you know, making her understand you can't give Cameron food. You have fruit snacks, you know, don't, don't give him one. And of course, siblings tease each other just, just in general. But that was one of the things that we talked to her about at, as a young age. You can, you can tease your brother because Lord knows he teases you, but never tease him about food. So She's been so great at that. But, you know, that was a conversation that that we had to have because, of course, we would never want him to feel, you know, different. And for the most part, one of the things that we did, too, was really try to get everybody in the house on a similar diet as him. So that way he wouldn't have to feel uncomfortable because, I mean, at the end of the day, the type of diet that he's on is probably the diet that we all need to be on anyway. (laughs) You said the pizza, like, you know, you only need one or two spices made me think the same thing like to myself or you have long-term effects and I'm like we need to shorten that and don't overindulge so that makes perfect sense there but you're right the type of foods that you just named are ideal for all of us but it's great that he doesn't feel left out and the family has accommodated him so that it's just it's your norm and as you're speaking like my son is six right now so you're talking about the diagnosis and I'm like, that's my boy. He is six. And I'm just thinking of, you know, what that must have been like and felt like because, you know, moms and their boys, it's like a special connection there. And I'm just like, I can't, you know, I can't imagine, um, you know, having to deal with that in at such a young age. Um, But another way transitioning a bit that you and I now were in the club of being two people who lost parents. And I always say at a young age, because I feel like if you lose your parents, you know, when you are in your 20s, 30s, or even below that, it feels like, you know, you got gypped in some way, shape or form. At least sometimes I feel that way. I talk about it here on the podcast. I talk about, you know, that experience as being a new mom and losing a parent and feeling like, I was at the height of my career planning wise. And so during this pandemic, you recently lost your father, who I know you were very close with. And so I know this is still a tender topic, but can you even put into words 
like what that experience was like, especially during a time like COVID and this pandemic? It's been difficult, Jamira. It it really has. Um, it's it's honestly hard to even put it in words. I think all loss is difficult. So, you know, one person's loss is not necessarily, you know, greater than than another person's loss. What was especially hard for me though in this loss was it was around the holidays and it was quick. It was quick. It was difficult. He he got sick shortly after um after Thanksgiving. He didn't make it till Christmas. And that was hard. We we had held out so much faith that he was going to be fine, that he was going to, you know, go in the hospital. They were going to, you know, give him everything he needed and, and he would be back home in time for Christmas. I remember telling my kids that, you know, Papa, he'll be back by Christmas. He was doing so well. We would we FaceTimed him every day. That was the difficult thing of it being in a pandemic. We couldn't be with him. So that is still very, very hard not being there with him. We thought he'd be back by Christmas, but he didn't. And and that that has been difficult. Very difficult. My dad was 58. He was 58. And you 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 could not have told me that my dad would not be here to see my kids go to college, that he wouldn't be here for me to be 50 and 60 and and so forth and so on. So it it has been hard. What I have been trying to hold on to is Obviously, the the memories that we that we've had for the past thirty six years of my life that I was, even though it, it went so quick in terms of him being here one day and gone the next, that we were able to say I love you every day those those past couple weeks before he transitioned. That we had times filled with laughter during that that time. That we were sort of, even though I don't live life with regrets. I think for me, if Maybe if I could have changed something, I would have opened up my mind to the possibility that he could have died. I did not open my mind up to that possibility. And again, I don't think it was necessarily that I was naive. It was that he was just doing so well. We we laughed on the phone every day sort of leading up, up to it. So it was just like he just took a turn so quick and it just took him out. I think if I could have done something differently, maybe just opening my mind up to that, maybe I would have felt a little bit more like things were resolved. But I mean, you know, things being resolved is not something that we're guaranteed. Life is not something that that we're guaranteed. So um, I honestly just try to hold on to the good memories that I have of him, knowing that he loved me, knowing that I loved him, knowing that um, I said I love you, you know, the day before he passed, that God is God is still God. I don't have a, a grudge or a beef with God, you know, about it all, but just knowing that God will get me through. It's interesting because you mentioned like him being so young and you mentioned you feel like he was here one day, gone the next. And so my mom was 50 when she passed away. She celebrated her 49th birthday in April. By November, she had passed the week before Thanksgiving. So it's so hard during the holidays and so Whenever you're listening to this, you know, audience, if you just remind yourself to check in on your friends who have lost loved ones because the holidays are so hard. And until you are in this club that, you know, it's a crappy club to be in, but it's nice to know you're not alone. And so you have to definitely lean on the support of people who've been where you are. Because like you, Shillies, I've never in a quadrillion years would have thought that my mother, when I gave birth to my daughter, wouldn't be here to see her graduate and be at the wedding, at, you know, for my kids. And it's just the weirdest thing. But what really struck me that what you said is that opening up to the possibility that he wouldn't be here. And for us, my mom was such a positive person and she was a godly woman. So she just always had faith until the end, knowing she knew and a handful of people knew that her cancer was terminal and that she most likely wasn't going to make it, but she never told us that. And she never even made us think that that was a possibility. And so it's just when you have this idea that things can work out and there, you're in a reality, you know, I'm like you, I really wish I would have opened up my eyes to, to be like, okay, she may not be here. So let's definitely savor every second. You know, I've said, I love you. I did all the things like, but 
just being feeling like prepared because our personality types, we want to feel prepared. Um, we're planners in the sense of we plan everything and we want to make sure every every T is crossed and every I is dotted. And, and this is something is, is out of our controls. And I think that is some of the hardest things to deal with is knowing that these type of things are out of your control. And so I'm curious to know what advice do you have for someone that may be dealing with a sick parent or someone that has a grief ahead of them, because you're still in the thick of grief. And for me, it took years before I really allowed myself to grieve. And so what advice could you offer to someone that is just not even trying to accept what their reality is? Definitely the the advice that, that I would give is to definitely hold out hope. I'm a person of faith. So, you know, God can do miracles. You know, he he definitely can. But at the same time, while you're holding out hope, accept whatever the, the possibilities are, you know, that it could be unto death or, you know, it could be some sort of an issue that the person might have if they're able to, to the parent rather would have, um, if they're able to pull through. Again, I really wish that I had sort of thought through those possible outcomes and I would have maybe been more prepared. It hit me, you know, within 24 hours. It just it just took me all the way out within a 24 hour time span. So definitely other advice would be to to savor each moment, you know, say those things that that you want to say. Definitely say I love you. And just in general, you know, even if your parent is not sick, saying I love you at the end of a call, we Somebody doesn't have to be sick to unfortunately pass the next day, you know, things just happen. So, you know, just saying those things that you want to say and loving people well, treating people well. In terms of managing grief, I think it's that's different for, for each person. For me, one of the things that is really helpful is just sort of giving myself, not rushing the process. It was really difficult around Valentine's Day. And like you just mentioned, you know, holidays are difficult. I was not expecting for Valentine's Day to be a difficult holiday. That wasn't necessarily a holiday, you know, that I spent with my dad. But I think just knowing that my mom doesn't have her husband, knowing that he's not going to be here, you know, for his birthday in a, in a few months. So the holidays was, was really, I mean, Valentine's Day was, it was really difficult. And I think for me, I have, I'm currently like in the space of trying to be strong, you know, because it's hard for my children. It's hard for my mother. It's hard for my brother. So I'm trying to be strong for everybody else. But my advice for other people would be, you know, allow yourself to to feel, you know, you don't necessarily have to be strong for everybody else. You don't even have to be strong for yourself. You know, if you want to, you know, push through and, and have a good day one way, I mean, one day, then do that. If you want to, you know, cry and not get out of bed the next day, do that too. Just allow yourself to feel because I was holding it in. That's that's what I realized with Valentine's Day. I was holding it in, holding it in, holding it in. And then Valentine's Day came and that whole weekend I was in the bed. I was in the bed. My husband had to, you know, just sort of manage the kids. I couldn't deal. Just allowing yourself to feel therapy is probably a, another good avenue as well. Um, I know my mom is currently in grief counseling. I have not started grief counseling yet, um, but it is something that I plan to do soon. I was typically a proponent of, of therapy prior to this anyway. I, I would go every other season or whatnot. So it's probably that season for me to, um, to definitely get back in it. Are you tired of asking or answering the dreaded question, what's for dinner? Are you over eating the same things over and over again? I've been there and I know how costly and time consuming it can be to plan meals for your family. I now use Plan to Eat to meal plan, prep, and store recipes. Plan to Eat is my go to app and software that makes mealtime so much better these days. I've been using it for years and I don't know what I would do without Plan to Eat. If you're curious to know what the big fuss is about, head over to bit.ly slash Jemira, P-T-E, all lowercase, and plan to eat totally free for a month. Check out the show notes for more details and thank me later. I tell people often that therapy saved my life. And I say that in the sense of when you said, allow yourself to feel, 
I purposely was picking up things to do. I I had a newborn at the time. I was two years married. I had a business. I focused on everything except for my feelings. And if you don't allow yourself to grieve, you you just will never uh, move in your full capacity going forward. And so for myself, therapy, when I was forced to deal with the pain, the hurt, the questions, and you said you didn't have a beef with God, I will be straight up and be like, I just did not understand how he could take someone who was such a blessing and who just everyone loved so much. Like, what are you doing? But you're reminded that he needed her more than we did and her job here was done. And so it's just one of those things like, and we talking about actually losing someone from a, like a death passing, you can grieve people who are still walking this earth, but it could be a loss of a relationship, a friendship or something that you really wanted. And sometimes we don't fully allow ourselves to grieve a loss in whatever capacity. And then I feel like that prevents us from fully walking, walking in our purpose. And so I do hope someone listening takes the time to talk to a grief counselor, because like I said, it was a game changer for me and to just sit and just pour out your feelings as needed to someone who's unbiased and someone that is trained to listen and hear you when sometimes it's hard to communicate with the people in your family or even your friends who don't, you know, totally understand any, you know, what you're going through. So um, yes, counseling all day, every day, it was my saving grace. And so I really am an advocate for that as well. And so Shalise, my mother's passing taught me the importance of living and walking in purpose. And so I'm just curious to know, has your outlook on life changed at all since losing your father? Absolutely. Similar to you, it it definitely affirmed to me the importance of making the most of our time here on earth and living each day focused on what's meaningful because tomorrow is, is, is just simply not promised. And I learned that. I learned that, you know, sometimes we think that we're going to live forever, that we have more time. And that's not to say that, you know, every day should be, you know, gloomy or, you know, worried about, oh, you know, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? But just understanding that that life is a gift. I think that's definitely the biggest lesson that I learned. Life is a gift. Saying I love you is important. Giving roses while I still can is important. Going after my dreams is important. Loving myself and others well, that's important. Fulfilling my unique purpose, that's important. I am just so focused right now on just making the most of each day. Losing my dad was a difficult thing, but I've been able to at least be more encouraged to to make my time count because God knows he made his time count. He made his time count. And you know, when my time is up, I want people to be able to to say those those wonderful things that we all said about him. I want people to be able to say those wonderful things about me. And I want to feel good with the life I lived. No, same thing. And it definitely opened up my eyes like, girl, you could say you want to do all these things. Why not now? Why are you not letting go of dead weight? Why are you still focused on all the wrong things when you know in your heart of hearts, this is not what you're supposed to be doing. And so for me, I was feeling called to do other things in my life career-wise, which led me to coaching for creatives and this podcast and the coaching space and just loving and supporting other moms and wives. And so I was like, you know, I, I'm at the height of my wedding planning career, but I'm feeling like he needs to use me in other ways. And so my mom's you know, passing taught me show up where you're supposed to show up and not spend any time or energy on things that will not matter and you will not be proud of when your time comes. And so, you know, I really hope someone is encouraged, as you said, to get moving, get doing and stop making excuses for things that just don't make sense when our time here is short. So you wear so many hats as well as a mom and a wife and a business owner and advocate and all the things that you do. And so I want to know what are some ways that you should least ensure that you are allocating your time and your energy to the areas that need your attention, especially since now, you know, we are fully walking in purpose. How are we making time to do that? 
Yes, you got to be intentional about this time. <laughs> it's like the favorite word we use here on this podcast. Yes, intentional, yes. yes. <laughs> That's real because I'll be honest, you know, a lot of times we can make excuses. I, I have been famous in the past for making excuses, but for me, with wearing all of these different hats, you know, that I feel I'm called to wear in this season, I think that's key too. You know, wearing hats is one thing, but if you're not supposed to be wearing all those hats, don't wear them all. For me, the hats that I feel called to wear in this season, I have to be intentional about how I spend my time because, you know, those 24 hours, they go by fast, so, so fast. And right. Yes. And it's like a lot of times, I feel like any and everything is is just trying to fight for my attention all at once. And I would say, you know, I'm not always perfect with how I allocate my time and my energy, but I have been really mindful and just intentional about how I prioritize my days and what I focus on. This question is even funny too, because I'm currently doing an email series for my newsletter subscribers where I'm actually talking about my daily focuses. And I literally had to, you know, come up with, okay, these are the things that you're going to focus on, you know, every single day, even if that means that you're not going to get to some of the things, you know, because you can't do it all, you know. And that's that's the thing too with, with making the time is understanding that I can do a lot, but I cannot do everything. So I have to remind myself of that often. So Some of the ways um, that I do sort of allocate the time, you know, and definitely with the energy piece is smart scheduling. And what I mean by that is being honest and keeping it real with myself, not saying that I'm going to do something tomorrow if I know I need more time to do it beyond that. For my Google Calendar, that's definitely color coded. (laughs) It houses everything. It, It does because I'm one of those type of people. You know, I prefer not to multitask to the max. It, it really makes me anxious when I do that. So I tend to break things up. So like an example would be during the day I work and then I'm managing virtual learning with the kids. So nighttime is family time and me time. That means that I generally don't do business meetings or calls after six o'clock. That's that's important to me because I can't do I can I can wear all those hats, but I can't wear them all at the same time. So that's that's really important for me. Another thing that is helpful for me too is limiting distractions. So because I'm a content creator, I naturally love social media. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm the exact opposite. That's the funny part. (laughs) I love the relationship with social media. Yes. Yes, But I mean, with, with that, it's like I have to be disciplined because if I'm going on there to post, That's one thing. But going on there to post and then staying around for 30 minutes, that means that I can't get to my business stuff. That means that I can't help my kids. That means that I can't take a time to, you know, enjoy some tea or to to do a meditation. So I have to be disciplined and limit the distractions. And even outside of social media, I am a person that thinks all the time. So it's like ideas come into my mind all the time. A new to-do comes into my mind all the time. So I have to be really intentional about sort of like guarding my mind, so to speak. So I do a brain dump and then I also have a written parking lot. And basically what that means is like, if I'm working on something, if I'm doing something with the kids or I'm doing something for business, if something comes in my mind that has nothing to do with what I'm currently working on, I just write it down. And I try to be disciplined to leave it there until I'm ready to get to that. Because again, you know, with wearing all the hats, wear them all. But I just have to really tell myself often, you can't do all these hats at at one time. So those are just some of the things that I I try to do to sort of allocate my time better than my energy. It's interesting because I'm in, I'm envisioning you with all of the different like glow getter type of hats, <laughs> and then it's like which one is on top that you see that is actually the focus, even though we have all these ideas underneath and all these things we want to do, but which one is in the spotlight that we need to focus on that is super important or a priority? And so it's just interesting because I I visualize that as well, you know, when you said that, so. I love it. I love it. I love it. And so, Shalise, you are a part of the Well Rounder community, and you know how we roll over here. We do not believe in the word balance. And so, yeah, right? So, you manage your businesses, you're a social butterfly, you put your family first always. 
but I want to know what is your definition of living well-rounded? Great question. For me, I would say that living real well-rounded to me is cultivating a life with purpose that you love. I, I, that, I think that's my definition for it. For me, it's loving myself. It's loving my people. It's having a good time and fun. It's um, it's offering my gifts to the world. Um, and it's definitely growing and glowing for me, for sure. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And so what are you most looking forward to in this next season of your life? Hmm, that's a good question, too. Hopefully a vacation at. <laughs> oh, no, that's right. <laughs> Hopefully a vacation at some point. I mean, I haven't had you one. deserve it. <laughs> I haven't had one in a long time. Yeah, me and my husband, we'll have to think of something, you know, safe yet fun that, you know, that we can do, you know, maybe with the kids too. I'm also coming up on my one year blog anniversary. Congratulations. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking forward to um to just growing the Shalise Tyson brand, the blog as well as the shop. And, you know, I'm just excited to continue and encouraging others. That that's a big passion of mine. I wasn't a cheerleader as <laughs> as a as a kid, um, but you know I feel like in my adult life I'm a big cheerleader. So I'm just excited to you know just keep encouraging um, you know other women and glow getters and launching some new things later on this year. Yeah, and that's what I love about you is the fact that you do cheer others on. You are not afraid to share the spotlight and also create content and resources for other moms, wives, and people that do want to live that glow getter lifestyle, which I think is so awesome. And I love, like I said, following your Instagram because there's so many fun things on there. It's, it's lighthearted and it feels like it's things that I can actually implement and do as well. So that's one of the things I love about following your page. It, it feels down to earth and relatable. And that's so important so that, you know, people can feel connected and not feel like there's no way in heck I can do this activity with my kid or try to accomplish all the things. No, it's like, you can do this too, and it will make a difference in your family and in your life. And I love that. Thank you. I love it. And so on a personal level, what are you saying no to in order to say yes to what matters most in this upcoming season? I think what I am saying no to is self-doubt. Ooh, that's good. Yeah, self-doubt has a way of, of creeping in. And I'm, I'm going to be saying no to that because for this next season, you know, I need to be confident in myself so that I can push forward. So, yes, I'm saying no to self-doubt. Oh, that's so good. And I'm legit writing that down because that's something that whew, we all are like, eh, no, I can't do it because someone else is doing it or I'm not good enough or I don't have all the tools and resources. And I say it all the time that people are killing it and they don't even have half of what you have. And so if they can, you can. They are proof that it can be done. So just go after it anyway. So that's so good. I love it. All right, Chalice, we are going to turn, make a turn and do some rapid fire. But this season of the podcast, I'm also introducing this or that. And so we've mixed it up and I have some questions for you. Are you ready to dive in? Let's do it. Sounds fun. <laughs> All right. So this is a question that I keep around because the answers are always different. And you just mentioned a vacation. And so you're stuck on an island. What are three things that you must have and you cannot take? Your kids and the hubs is all you. What are you taking on the island? Oh, man, this is hard. Only three things? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I'm going to have to go with my cell phone. There it is. Yep. <laughs> food. I need some good food. So an uh, arsenal of food. And my bed. I love my bed. My bed is like one of my favorite places. So if I could bring my bed on that island with me, that'd be great. <laughs> Good. Just pulling your phone, eating your snacks, laying in the bed. <laughs> oh, my <I'm> bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. And so you mentioned you weren't a cheerleader when you were growing up, but what did you want to be when you were a little Shalice? I actually wanted to be quite a few things. I think probably the thing I wanted to be the longest was an actress. I had wanted to be an actress when I was like, 12. I did one audition and never again. I was like, I am not made for this. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> so I was right with you there. Netflix or YouTube? Netflix for sure. Awesome. If you could hire a personal chef or once a week cleaning service or a personal driver, which of the three would you choose? 
cleaning service hands down. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. And what is your dream vacation destination once this pandemic is over? Maybe Greece or um, maybe the Maldives. Hmm. Maldives is on my list. We got to go to Greece right before crazy things happened. So now we, I'm with you with the Maldives. <laughs> what is one thing about yourself that surprises people? Hmm. Let's see. Maybe that I'm an ambivert. I think it depends on, on who, who you're talking to. They might think I'm an extrovert or someone else might think I'm an introvert. So <laughs> I think people might be surprised to know that I'm a, a good mix of both. So you're at brunch and are you going for the salty items or the sweet? Sweet. <laughs> yes. Pancakes, French toast, all the things for me too. Pile with syrup. <laughs> yes. And some whipped cream and sugar on the top, all the thing. <laughs> so phone call or text if someone is trying to reach, sh- trying to reach you. Text, text, text. <laughs> hey, I'm phone call. Just call me so I can multitask and listen and type. If you call me, I'm an answer. If you text me, it may take me a minute because I have the phone like elsewhere. So <laughs> oh, that's so funny. That's funny. What was your first job? Believe it or not, I was a um a wait wait staff at a banquet hall. So oh, it, doing events was like destined for me. <laughs> and I was on the ground in the trenches. I love it in the trenches. <laughs> What's your guilty pleasure? Hmm, I would say currently Grey's Anatomy. I did not watch it like when I, when it first came out. I'm currently reading Year of Yes, and I was getting my hair braided a couple weeks ago the stylist she had on Grey's Anatomy. And like I said, I never really watched it. And we went through like three episodes and I have been binging it on Netflix ever since. (laughs) Funny, because I'm the opposite. I started watching Grey's Anatomy and I just fell off, you know, like in the beginning and stopped watching it. But it has so many good like episodes when you actually do go back and watch them. But it's just a lot. It's, it's a lot. lot. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> it has me hooked now. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, you won't be bored if we still sit in the house. You'll be watching all of it. Oh, okay. So when your kids are all grown up, what do you hope that they say about their mother? Mm-hmm. Good one. I hope that they say that I love them exceptionally well and that I raised them well. So important. And every time I ask that question, it makes me stop and think, okay, if something knock on wood were to happen to me now, what would my children say about me as their mom and as someone who loves them unconditionally? But do they feel that? Do they know that? Can they proudly say that? And so it encourages me to just step it up a notch every single time I hear that question and and get the answer. Okay, Shalise, this was awesome. It was so great to hear from you and hear in your heart and how you're doing in this season because, you know, we all love you so much and it just, you know, watching everything that you've gone through has definitely been inspiring to keep pushing through and, and keep moving in regardless of what is coming your way. And so where can our well-rounders find you on the web? Sure. Sure. Um, first I just wanted to say thank you so much, Jamira, uh, for this opportunity to be able to connect with you today, as well as your listeners. I love the show. I love what you're doing. So um, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part. Where everybody can find me, you can find me on the web at ShaliceTyson.com. And that's S-H-A-L-Y-C-E-T-Y-S-O-N.com. For the shop, you can find that at ShaliceTyson.com as well, forward slash shop. In the Instagram streets, you can find me (laughs) at Shalice Tyson. Awesome. Yes, you guys, make sure you give Shalisa a follow, slide into her DMs, let her know that you heard her here on the show. And if you enjoyed today's episode, which we really hope you did, make sure you subscribe to the show and you leave us a five-star rating and a quick review. Mention Shalisa's name in the review, and then we will also reach out to you to say hello. And again, if you guys are looking for some dope merch and stuff that is intentional, Shalise has you covered there. Make sure you are following this podcast and our website, blog, and all the things so that you can be in the know with all things Living Well-Rounded. I appreciate you, Well-Rounders. I hope that you continue to stay safe, stay positive, and to focus on what matters most. Bye. 
friends, thanks for kicking it with us this week. Remember to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode airs. I'd love it if you leave us a review and share this goodness with your squad. Until next time, seek a well-rounded life and remember to focus on what matters most.